This is the first time we've given a joint talk. It is basically an infomercial for a course that we teach that I was here this morning with the deans where they were really encouraging everybody to mix it up when you're um, on campus thinking about going outside your own area of research and focus. So that's what we're doing. We crossed the street. We've crossed the street. That's Steve has walked all the way here from GSB. Um, and our meetings are really good. I have my Fitbit because we alternate that I go to his place, he comes here. Um, but on a serious note, we developed this course last spring. We did a test drive. It is a graduate level course. Um, we're happy to say that it was very successful. And we're going to be offering it again next spring. And what we tried to do with it is to really think through how can we take a specific discipline, energy efficiency, and have students look at it from the perspective of technology, policy, and markets and investment. And so it doesn't, you do have to be a graduate student, you do have to have some background in energy, um, but you don't need to have any deep background or really any familiarity with energy efficiency because it's trying to take it as an example of how do these different um, areas of technology policy and markets intersect. Steve? <laughs> All right. So with that then, let's, we're going to, as Diane said, this is the Steve and Diane show or the Diane and Steve show. And essentially we're going to have a conversation. You're going to listen in on it and by the end you can ask some questions. So my first question to you then is, what is energy efficiency and why should I care? Oh, we did a prep though. You were going to ask the students. You had a question to them. The students, <laughs> who here has studied energy efficiency before? Okay, as part of a course or it's a course onto it itself? Part of a course. So no one has done an energy efficiency course. Okay, who's, who's, sure, who's not sure if they have studied energy efficiency? <laughs> okay, whose parents have told them to turn off the lights when they leave the room? There we That's go. That's kind of efficiency, yes. <laughs> That's energy efficiency. Okay. Oh, that's my first question. We're going to go back and forth with questions. So Steve has just asked me, so what is energy efficiency and why should I care? This is energy efficiency. Um, I think you're all old enough to know that we have had lighting for years and years was incandescent light bulbs. And now we have many new technologies, primarily LED. So the easiest explanation of what is energy efficiency it is new technologies that provide the same service but use less energy. So in one sense, energy efficiency is all about technologies and bringing them into use inside buildings, inside vehicles, inside um, uh, factories, et cetera. But we also have another part of energy efficiency that is um, oftentimes called energy conservation. And that is changing behavior to use less energy. And so sort of that is what I asked just a moment ago. Switching off the lights if you're not in the room. There's absolutely no reason in the world to have lights on in a room if nobody's in the room. There might be a couple of reasons, but in general, it's not a you know, you don't really need to just have lights on a room, hotel rooms, etc. Um, but this is an area where we see new technology and what's so exciting, that's what we want to get you all excited about, is that we all have smartphones and so there are apps on smartphones that can alert you if, okay, the air conditioning has gone completely out of whack and you can either have it do an automatic uh, turn down or you can be alerted, whatever. But again, energy efficiency is both the technology side but it's also behavior and those two combined is what allows less use of energy. So why does it matter? Um, this is an example from California. As um, Richard said, I was a commissioner with the California Public Utilities Commission, which is a state agency. All the states in the US have them that regulate utilities and um, very, very involved in energy efficiency. California basically discovered energy efficiency 40 years ago. Literally, the concept was, was 
first um, developed here. And so we are considered the international leader on energy efficiency, though there's a lot going on elsewhere in the world now. So this is just taking California. We have had flat electricity demand per capita, despite the fact that we all have a whole lot more devices than we did. And we've done that for 40 years now. Whereas in the rest of the United States, the usage per capita has increased 50%. So that is a huge success story with energy efficiency. Environmental savings that this very focused effort on energy efficiency in California has allowed us to avoid building 30 major new power plants, which has translated into tremendous savings in terms of both air quality, water usage, et cetera. Cost savings. Um, the way that you can think of energy efficiency, again, very simplistically, is that, um, again, you, I don't know if you, how many people actually have received a bill from a utility and paid it? Okay, so you get the general concept. You're not that you physically got it, it can be online. But basically, when your energy is used as either an individual or as a business or as an industrial owner, um, the local utility in some fashion sends a bill that says, here's the cost of your electricity and natural gas usage. So if you are using less energy, very simplistically, your bill is less. And over this 40 years, because of the activities we've had with codes and standards and just getting more equipment out there, it has been $100 billion in avoided payments for electricity and natural gas. Um, I oftentimes say it's not recognized, but this is probably the single biggest economic development program in California. And then the last one are carbon savings, that we've had 30 million tons of carbon dioxide avoided since 2003, equivalent to taking six million cars off the road because we didn't build those power plants and therefore we avoided the emissions. Okay, Steve, what's the energy efficiency market? How big is that opportunity Well, I'm out there? glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> So across the street, we uh, talk about markets and um, economics, and I always like to break down what I'm talking about. So let's imagine, and we're going to focus, all, everything that we've been saying has to do with buildings. We're not talking about industrial efficiency, and we're not talking about transportation efficiency. Uh, we can talk about it in the Q&A, but for, for now, let's just focus our attention on the built environment. So the built environment, essentially, you can segment the market, Okay, and you segment it by kind of building and who owns it. So you have the mush market, which is municipal, university, schools, and hospitals. Those are all civic buildings, and they have public owners. Sometimes you have private owners as well. Um, then you have large commercial um, and industrial, and you have small, medium commercial, and then you have residential. So that's essentially how you break out you know, who is the customer and the kind of building that you're dealing with. And then you think about the interventions, which are the categories. And these are, you can think about them as the hardware and the software that bring about energy efficiency. And so you have things like the building envelope, the HVAC system, um, water heating and lighting. And just to give a sense for in the US, um, how much spend there is. Well, if you think about um, in 2016, you had a total of about $68 billion. And you can see that building envelope and HVAC system are um, quite large. Lighting is still a thing. People are still um, essentially replacing their light bulbs and also installing ballasts to essentially have control across the entire lighting system. You hear a lot about lighting as a service. I'm dubious of that type of um, mm -hmm. moniker. But one thing to actually understand about this, it's the demand response and enabling IT, low spend, high opportunity. That's essentially where the future is going to go. I'm not going to take away your thunder because we're going to talk a lot about that. But don't, don't be alarmed that essentially high dollars leads to high savings. That may be in the past and that may be in developing economies. Um, but in the future, you're going to see a lot in the um, uh, ICT industry. $68 billion, pretty good given that we came from 35 billion only a few years ago. So that's the US. What about in terms of uh, the globe? 
$388 billion. To put that into context, though, that's only 8% of the actual spend in the built environment. Uh, and again, the majority of this is in the building envelope. And I'll just stop. My background's in civil engineering. Um, does everyone know what the building envelope is? Who does? <laughs> what is it? It's basically the shell. Yeah. It's the outside, right? It's whatever touches the external environment. That's right. So all the glass, all the fenestration, as it's called, all the interfaces with the external environment, all the um, cladding that's on the outside, that's essentially your first line of defense and essentially your best line of defense when it comes to um, energy efficiency. So that's on the, again, this is on the things side, the hardware side, and then, and the software side, and this is on the services side, um, much less, but what do services actually mean? Essentially, it's a guaranteed way. Um, these are provided by energy service companies. It's a guaranteed way to ensure that you have savings over a long time. When you install an intervention, either it's hardware or software, you want to have that savings. You, you're, you want that savings to accrue over time. And one of the biggest things you can do is essentially ensure that the system that you install is working perfectly over time, because that's essentially where the efficiency gains are gonna happen. It's not good enough to install it once, and then it's never maintained or it's never used properly. So those services companies, they basically make their money on ensuring that the efficiencies that are promised are actually delivered. And why are we spending all this money on energy efficiency, right? Well, here's, here's something for a gut feel, and apologies, like, it seems like there's some efficiency on this um, slide here. Well, <laughs> what we have here is um, here. essentially. Is this gonna, there you no, no, no. I, I, I got it. It's, so these are supposed <laughs> to be bar graphs here. And does everyone know what the levelized cost of electricity is? Who said yes? <laughs> You're you did. Scare them insane. So <laughs> what? How would you describe the LCOE? That's right. So put another way, it is the constant dollar amount on average per unit that you need to receive to make sure that all your capital, all your operational, and all your investor costs are paid off. Okay? And so you've probably heard that you know, solar is something like six cents a kilowatt hour or $60 per megawatt hour, and wind is given its increased capacity factor maybe around 30 but energy efficiency, and this is terrible, it took my thunder away, but essentially it's from <coughs> zero to 50. But if anyone has actually looked at um, things like the McKinsey curves and so forth of, 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 of energy efficiency, you'll notice that there's actually a negative cost. So what's another way to interpret a negative cost? Savings, right? Savings. So this is one reason, actually, if there's basically money that's on the floor and it's right there and we should be picking it up, why aren't we? I think we need some policy, right? <laughs> why is government involved in energy efficiency? Thank you, Steve. Um, do we have a hard stop in seven, seven minutes? minutes? Okay, we're going to try and whip through yeah. this. Um, so this is why we teach the course to try to include policies as well because basically everywhere you look there are market failures and while Stanford is very much in favor of markets we really like them they deliver competition they deliver lowering prices this is an area where you actually have to think through and understand if you're bringing in new technologies what's the policy basis that's going to support those new technologies so the four major barriers. Um, energy prices, unfortunately, they don't reflect full costs, much less societal costs. Even here in California, we're just now putting in place a policy that will actually put in every single sort of government decision on um, energy, a greenhouse gas adder. And it's taking us a long time to get there, and really we don't have that elsewhere. Um, consumers lack information about uh, 
the opportunities, the benefits that, you know, your average person is not walking around saying, oh, I guess I know how much insulation there is in my home, and I guess I know that I could improve it, et cetera. So there's just a general lack of information. Because energy efficiency in some ways is invisible as compared to the windmill, the wind turbines, the solar PV, et cetera. Um, split incentives. We have uh, just a gigantic problem throughout the world um, where you have the owner of the building who makes investments in putting in a new lighting system, a more efficient air conditioner, et cetera, but the tenants pay the energy bills. And so the tenants are incentivized to lower costs, but they don't control that building. So there's huge efforts that go on in the policy arena to try to make this win-win. And the hassle factor, that you have a lighting contractor, you have an HVAC contractor, et cetera, and how can you organize things so all of this can work together? So we don't want to scare you off. I mean, it's, you know, these problems have been overcome, they are being overcome, but in this area in particular, understanding how government and policy tries to address these is important. Um, this is from a report last year, the International Energy um, Agency, uh, that really does bring out that policy is fundamental for energy efficiency. We now have 30% of final energy demand globally is covered by energy efficiency policies, which can be mandatory codes and standards. If you're going to build a building, you might as well build it efficient. If you're going to sell a refrigerator, you might as well use the latest technology so it's efficient, et cetera. And we see increasingly focus on um, transportation and cars. Again, with our tremendous concerns about um, carbon, we want to have our vehicles as efficient as possible. And because of many barriers in the market, if we have the technology to make those vehicles efficient, that's what governments say we can have a role of requiring a certain level of efficiency. Um, we now have more than 2.3 million barrels a day that is being avoided because of our standards. Um, this is my last one on policy. This is just a slide showing about 25 years um, of what's happened in terms of savings with our utilities. Utilities are oftentimes a vehicle, uh, not just in the United States, but in the world, because they collect money through their bills, so you can put small charges to finance these programs, as well as they can have actual outreach to their customers and talk about energy efficiency. And this, again, is a very bright spot that you tend to hear more about you know, PVs and wind, um, but the, what's been happening in energy efficiency is very, very encouraging in terms of the actual savings, which translates then into avoided environmental impacts, carbon savings, et cetera. So, are we all done, Steve? <laughs> Clearly not. Um, so we've all heard about LEDs, and we've all heard about refrigerators. Does everyone know about refrigerators? Why? What's the big deal about them? <laughs> yes, yes. So they use a lot of energy, but do they use less now? Yes. Okay. And, and have they gotten bigger have they gotten or bigger? smaller? There you go, right? <laughs> so you're getting the same or a better service for less input, right? And these are the two golden children of energy efficiency things, right? LEDs and uh, refrigerators. But that's there's so much more to, to go. And, um, <laughs> well, we only have five minutes. <laughs> are you saying I'm slow? Uh, so <laughs> according to IEA, thinking about a mid-level scenario by 2050, and what that basically means is, can we reduce um, emissions by 50% from 2007, um, 2007 levels by 2050 globally? Okay? And what would be uh, required from a building's perspective to do that? Well, they've calculated that about 1,509 million tons of oil equivalent um, in aggregate between 2015 and 2050 would be saved. And just to put that in perspective, that's more than China, the US, the EU, India, Russia, and Japan cumulatively all of last year produced in terms of electricity. So it's a lot. And if you look at this graph, and this basically breaks down where the opportunities are, what do you see a lot of? You see a lot of heating and cooling. And that's 
really, from a hardware perspective, that's the next frontier, heating and cooling. If you're able to make people comfortable in hot environments or make them comfortable in cold environments, that's really where the um, opportunity lies. And if you guys are going to stick around on Friday, you're going to see a few startups or um, projects, innovative projects around here um, that deal with that. SkyCool is, is one of them. But that's just hardware. Software? OK. Um, we have a new, this is sort of another infomercial. Um, we have a new professor here, Dr. Rishi Jain, who his specialty is data analytics. And what has happened in the world of energy efficiency is that if you go back 10 years, you had a building and you would have to guess, basically, is it efficient? Is it not efficient? What should we do inside of it? Um, or you would spend um, a lot of money to get an on-site auditor who would go out and spend a day disrupt whatever is going on in the building to try to say, here's the potential. Um, and that's what to me is amazing. Despite the lack of really good tools, we've made a lot of progress. But this is where um, I in particular am really excited. I've been in this for close to 40 years. And we are really at a new frontier because what we have is we have the smart meters that have gone into many, many buildings. So instead of getting just energy usage once a month, we get it 50, every 15 minutes or even greater at some points in time. So the cost of sensors to know what's actually going on with different equipment in the buildings has also gone down. And we have a number of cities, and actually in California, it's going to become a law next year for the entire state where information about the usage in those buildings is collected by the governmental entity um, and then is made available in various databases back to the building owners and occupants, but more importantly, back to the public and back to the market, which is why we see companies coming in. So what we have is an explosion of data that with really great analytics, you can understand what's going on in buildings. You can, um, do, Professor Jane, for example, helped the, New York City had enacted one of these benchmarking. They had just millions, billions of pieces of data, but they didn't know how to analyze that. So he developed some very sophisticated algorithms, machine learning, to really identify where were the opportunities. So he has a great lab, and I'm helping him on sort of taking the technical side and translating it into what can be new policies put in place that's looking at entire cities and understanding that a building is not by itself, but it may be providing shading to another building. It may be completely unshaded. It may be in what we call heat islands, and that, that really impacts What's the usage in the building beyond the simulated to the actual and the hidden interdependencies? So this is another area, if you get interested in it, that really looks at data analytics and how we can um, be accomplishing more. So this is, I believe, our last question. What do we do about developing com countries? So China, 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 and then India. Okay. <laughs> um, you have this mass migration for urbanization in China. Um, between now and 2035, we're going to have 67% more residences on the globe. Um, China has taken it within their uh, five-year plan to decrease their energy um, intensity uh, by 45% between from 2005, number, uh, 2005 levels to 2050. They're well on their way. They have a top-down government. They had some trouble uh, a few years ago, <laughs> but they're well on their way. As they're doing that, the next um, country that is of significance will be India, simply because they are going to go through their own building boom. They have a, they're coming from a, a further um, depreciated level of energy demand, and that is destined to increase. So essentially, between China and India, that's where, that's where the energy efficiency market is going to grow, and that's where new technologies are going to be deployed. But they alone are not going to make, um, they're not going to save the day. Um, 
essentially the uh, OECD countries who have started from a relatively better position, um, whereas these folks are designing starting new, all of these interventions will be retrofits. So this will be a little bit tougher, but it cannot be ignored because that's about where about 30 to 40 percent of the gain is going to come from. So if you want to learn more about all of this, take our class in the spring. And in the meantime, if you can't wait till the spring. If you um, are at all intrigued, we know this isn't their area of focus, probably. But if you'd like to learn more, we do have some um, quite interesting research projects that are going on. And we're always interested in having students come and learn. So maybe one or two questions? OK. Sure. Uh, what are your opinions on this thermostats and homes? Um, I think that it's an example of new technology. It's really good because it's gotten people excited. Honeywell had thermostats for years. And believe me, nobody went to a cocktail party and said, wow, I just got my new Honeywell thermostat. <laughs> and so it, to me, part of this is instead of really boring things that um, people design, um, if you can make energy efficiency sexy and interesting to people, because it's a lot of individual decisions go into this. So that's one of the really great things about Nest is it got people interested in it. Um, but it's just one component. I mean, the nice thing is that within it, it can be sort of a hub for doing other things. But that alone doesn't change out inefficient lighting. That alone doesn't put insulation in a building. That alone doesn't have a more efficient air conditioner put in the day the air conditioning breaks down. So it's one tool. I like it a lot, but it's just one tool. Probably one more question. Oh, yes. She's ready to let us continue all uh, afternoon. All right. <laughs> um, you mentioned at the beginning that behavior change is a big part of energy efficiency. What are the tools you've seen most effective at changing behaviors? And what percentage of the problem of behavior changes? Um, well, the company that sort of created the world of behavior change is Opower. So this is another commercial for our course that we had. Um, we ran a series of lectures of just bringing folks in. Um, so we had Alice, Alex Lasky, the founder of Opower, come and talk. And Opower is a, he, he just came up with this idea, literally, of um, what if we could give people reports about their home energy usage that would compare you to your neighbor? He had a lot of science behind it that said nobody wants to look worse than their neighbor, especially if the report has, you know, the unhappy face on it. And then added in, you know, here's three things that you can do. So that probably is the biggest intervention that's happened. And now what's going on is um, when he first started it, there was no data analytics. There were really no smart meters. It was just a very crude tool. So this is where we're really looking at much better understanding of how to change behavior with much better um, uh, information about usage. You want to add? Yeah, gamification, Ohm Connect, and Simple Energy. Uh, there's a lot of um, interest in utilities around the world, as that is the because utilities have basically been looking at uh, customers as just meters or rate payers. And now, due to competition, uh, they want to get closer to the customer. They're seeing this as essentially their entrance into being closer to the customer, learning more about them, and then offering more services. We good? OK, well, I think time is up. So OK. Let's thank, uh...